The vast majority of us love animals and many of us have pets at home. We sometimes like to call them our fur babies. Now, do we know how to properly care for these fur babies? We asked an expert to share some advice with us today. Stephanie Bodnerchuk is a veterinarian with the Coldale Pet Clinic. Welcome to Bridge City News. Thank you. Our fur babies. Now, sometimes we have cold snaps. It's minus 30 outside. Should we really be careful about how much time we allow our pets to spend outdoors? Definitely depends on your dog and the breed and how much they're used to being outside. If you have a big Arctic breed with a heavy coat that's used to living outside, it's almost torture to bring them inside at times. But if you have your short-coated dog that's, you know, an indoor-outdoor dog, really pay attention to them. If they're out there lifting their feet, shivering, might be time to bring them in. Uh, not leaving them outside when you're gone for work so that you can see if they're cold is generally a good idea. How about people that add a lot of uh, accessories for their pets? You know, little sweaters, little booties for their dogs? I mean, it's more than just a fashion statement, isn't it? It's actually to protect them. Absolutely. They definitely have their place, uh, especially the boots. When it gets this cold, they don't want to go out and pee. Uh, put boots on to help their feet. And dogs that are working, keeping those coats on to keep their muscles nice and warm is going to prevent injuries as well if they get cold. Um, tend to pull muscles easier and just makes it easier for them to go outside for a walk without worrying about their paws freezing. Is that kind of feel awkward for the dog though, walking with these boots? Are they like, what are you putting on my feet here? This is... So it's definitely you know. something that you want to get your dog used to. You don't want to throw boots on and ask them to go for a walk. You know, right. put the boots on at home, give them treats, tell them it's okay, get them used to it before asking them to go out for a walk. Once they realize that those boots keep their feet warm and they can go out for longer periods, they almost look forward to having them put on. How about a dog house as well? Stephanie, should we make sure that it's well insulated? Absolutely. So something that's well insulated, out of the wind, with bedding, um, straw is an excellent insulating bedding just to make sure that they're out of that driving wind and snow. Um, if they have a big heavy coat, they're going to keep themselves pretty warm in a doghouse. And bowls too, you have to make sure that you don't give them a metal bowl, right, if they're lapping up the water? Yeah, so metal bowls would tend to freeze a bit faster. Um, there's heated bowls that you can get, so heated bowls and heated water buckets are fantastic for this time of year. You don't want to think that your dog has water outside, but the bowl's frozen, they can't actually get to it. So nice plastic heated bowls are a really good idea. How does that work when it comes to the life of a pet? They say usually seven to one for the human years, right? But if they're an indoor cat, is it longer seven to one? Outdoor cat or dog, is it five to one? Because they generally don't live as long because of the dangers and the elements outside? It's not so much the lifestyle of the pet, but the breed. Um, obviously you have more risks in an outdoor dog that's roaming but larger breed dogs tend to be a bit more per year than smaller breed dogs. Um, smaller breed dogs tend to live longer. Yeah, why is that? Just genetics. I mean, those big dogs are so lovable, but unfortunately they have shorter lifespans. Uh, but they're not they, as yappy usually as the little dogs, right? <laughs> maybe that's why they live so long. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, yeah, maybe, that's it. Now, the other thing too is I remember many years ago we had a, a beautiful family cat. His name was Putter. May he rest in peace. And uh, unfortunately, he got outside and he lapped up some antifreeze and he was gone the same day. Yeah. It crushed our family. Yeah. What is it about antifreeze? Is it the sweet smell, do you think, that attracts the cats? Yeah, so it does taste very sweet. So it's a good incentive for them to go and lap it up, but it's extremely toxic. Uh, they deposit crystals down in their kidneys. Um, they can go into kidney failure pretty quickly from antifreeze. So if you have cold weather, if you have animals living in your shop, you're going to want to really make sure that that's cleaned up. Yeah, absolutely, and make sure that our vehicles don't have any leaks, right? They make sure. leaks. Now, when it comes to animals and our pets, our fur babies, when we feed them during the wintertime, should we maybe ease up a little bit or feed them a little bit more so they can maybe add a little bit of the winter fat to keep them warm? So it definitely depends on their lifestyle. If you have an indoor dog that's going for the same amount of walks, you don't necessarily need to feed them more in the winter. If you have an outdoor dog, we might want to feed them a bit more because they're going to use some calories keeping warm. What times a day should we actually feed our dogs? Whatever's going to be consistent and works for your schedule, uh, generally breaking up into multiple feedings a day is a bit better for their metabolism. So morning and night, you know, when you leave for work, when you get home from work is fine. If you want to add a meal at lunchtime, it's good. Um, it's good to meal feed them instead of keeping food out all the time. You know, it's funny too, Stephanie, you know, people that as soon as they see an empty bowl in the middle of the day, it's like, well, that can't be right for Fifi or for Fluffy. Come on, let's fill it up, let's load it up. That's not necessarily a good thing, is it? It's not. They tend to get overweight. Uh, people think that they, you know, don't eat that much, but they tend to snack a bit too much. And I see them in for their yearly exams with, you know, a couple extra pounds each year. And it's just not good for their joints and overall health. So definitely, you know, if you're going to have a bowl there all day, measure what goes into that bowl in the morning. How about milk for a cat? Aren't cats actually lactose intolerant? 
as they get older, it can be a little bit hard on their stomach. You can see some looser bowel movements from drinking milk. They don't necessarily need it. Um, if they're used to having it all the time, it's probably not going to hurt, but it does have calories and can upset their stomach. It's not essential for them to have. When I was a volunteer board member of the SPCA in Red Deer many years ago, uh, we used to have people bring in a lot of empty peanut butter jars for the dogs, and that was a real treat. Yeah. The peanut butter. Yeah. And that's not going to harm the dogs, right? Not at all. Just make sure there's some diet peanut butters out now that actually have xylitol in them, uh, which can be very highly toxic. So, so long as it's a, a regular peanut butter with no artificial sweeteners in it, it's a wonderful treat. Keeps them busy, keeps the mind occupied. How about people that like to... I'm kind of guilty of this myself, spoil the dogs from the table and give them a little bit of human food. Is that a major no-no? Is that bad to do that? Depends on what you're giving them. If you're giving them... A little bit of chicken, maybe? A, a little, little bit, bit of, of chicken with no cooked bones. Don't give them the bone from your T-bone. Uh, it should be fine. Just make sure you're taking that into account with their daily calories. But Steph, dogs like to gnaw on the bones. They like to chew on the bones. They do, but unfortunately, the bones tend to get stuck in places that they, they shouldn't or they run the risk of actually perforating their intestines, oh, getting wow. stuck in their mouth. Uh, so it's something definitely cook bones to stay away from. Why is chocolate so toxic for pets? So it has a compound in it called theobromide, uh, which causes extremely high heart rate agitation, can actually cause seizures and even death at high doses. Wow. Yeah, so the darker the chocolate, the more toxic it is. So your semi-sweet and dark chocolates are going to be worse than milk chocolate. And obviously, a small dose in a big dog isn't going to be as much of a concern. But if a little dog gets into some dark chocolate, that can actually be quite life-threatening. I have friends that actually have a dog that loves vegetables. Yeah. You know, cucumbers and uh, radishes. <laughs> like, what? And the dog just loves eating yep. them, chewing on the crunch and so forth. So vegetables are fine? Vegetables, for the most part, are fine. Uh, so long as it's not in huge quantities that are going to upset their stomach, generally not a problem with vegetables. Uh, with fruits, yeah. grapes are something that you want to watch out for. Uh, they can be quite harmful. Or maybe get lodged? Actually, there's a compound in it in some dogs that will actually harm their kidneys. So wow. want to stay away from grapes. Now, a lot of times when we go out there shopping for our foods, pet foods, we want to get something that's affordable but healthy at the same time. You know, maybe uh, I remember with our cat, the cat had urinary tract infection and the vet that we took uh, our cat to said it was because of the food you're feeding your cat. It very well can be. You know, so yeah. how do we justify, you know, spending that much more money? I mean, we love our pets, obviously, but sometimes it can be three times the price. 100%. Right? So there's so some... So where do you find that fine line? The yeah, balance? the biggest thing I look for in a food uh, is going to be the research and development that goes behind the food. So not looking at the bright colors on the bag or, uh, you know, human grade ingredients, look at all the pretty fruits and vegetables on the front of the bag, looking at that company, how much research feeding trials they put into it. There's pet store foods that are absolutely excellent to feed. Um, if your cat has or dog has a specific medical condition, I would probably be listening to the veterinary advice if they need a special prescription diet. But for the vast majority of pets, just making sure it's a company that has a nutritionist on board, is doing the research development and feeding trials, and knowing that that food is formulated to be best for your pet. Are there certain chemicals within pet foods that we should maybe steer clear from for our pets? Not necessarily. I mean, the bag, the ingredient lists can be quite daunting at times. There's stuff in there that you don't necessarily We've know what it means. We've never heard of, right? Exactly. Yeah. How about high sodium? High sodium, we... Is that dangerous? For some conditions, so especially animals with heart disease, we want to stay away from high sodium foods. Uh, consult with your veterinarian uh, in terms of nutrition, they can help you decode that, those bag ingredients. Sometimes the words that they use aren't as daunting as they need to be. And again, you can get caught with the bag looks like something that I would eat, but maybe it's not necessarily the best thing for your pet. It's funny you talk about the packaging. I remember when I was a kid going shopping with my parents and seeing all of the kitty cereals, you know, the Fruit Loops and Cap'n Crunch and Cheerio, whatever, like, oh, because the packaging looks so Absolutely. great. It's got the cartoon animated characters yep. on the front. You know, that's what attracts the kids. Absolutely. <laughs> that's what attracts us too. <laughs> that's right. Now, how often should we actually take our pet in to the vet for a checkup? For the most dogs and cats, a yearly checkup is perfect. Just to make sure, you know, keep track of their weight, make sure that there's no lumps and bumps that have developed, if they're due for any vaccines that year. If your dog has special medical conditions or cat, you might need to see them more frequently. But generally, we recommend an annual health exam just to keep track of everything. Make note of any conditions that might arise that so that we catch everything early. So if I'm thinking of adopting a pet, I want to adopt a dog, let's say, maybe a puppy, how do I want to make sure that this puppy is a good fit for my, my family 
and that I'll be a good fur parent to this dog. So absolutely do your research. Uh, you can adopt a dog from a shelter is wonderful or getting a dog from a reputable breeder. Just knowing that this is a dog that's going to fit your lifestyle. Because it might be a hyper dog, right? Absolutely. It needs to be ran quite a bit. Yep. If you have, if you have a really active lifestyle, you might want to get a more active breed or an active mix. If you maybe have a bit more of a sedentary lifestyle, maybe consider adopting a senior animal. But really doing your research, not falling for that first cute puppy or kitten, uh, making sure that that's going to be a good fit for your lifestyle and that's going to be the best chance that that dog's going to stay with you for its entire life and everybody's going to be happy with that pet and just take away that stress if maybe it's not a good fit. Again, when I volunteered at the, uh, the shelter there in Red Deer, I remember we received a lot of Dalmatians. Shortly after 101 Dalmatians yes. came out and then people realized these may not be the best family pets. So that's a danger too, isn't it? Absolutely. We'll see these breed hypes come up. I know this year we had a lot of uh, movies that came out with sled dogs. And a Siberian Husky is not going to be a dog for everybody. They're wonderful if you have an active lifestyle or Babe came out and everybody wants a Border Collie. Right. You really have to, you know, not look at that cute dog that's really well trained on the silver screen. And or Russell think, Terrier, like when Frasier was popular Absolutely, show, right? absolutely. Just know that those dogs are impeccably well trained and know what kind of training goes in to get them to be that well behaved. I guess you have to focus and consider as well on uh, your allergies too. Absolutely. There's a lot of dander involved mm -hmm. with a pet and they shed quite a bit. That could be a factor as well. For sure. So some dogs that are less shedding might be less allergenic. The best thing to do, you can't guarantee that any dog is going to be hypoallergenic, but visit the kennel, visit the parents of the dogs if you can, and see if you react. That's going to be the best judge of whether you might react to those puppies or not. Because I know a lot of times the breeds that have what the poodle mix in with them, like the golden doodle, the labradoodle, is usually better for people who have allergies, or maybe a morky, yeah. you know, like the, uh, the Maltese and the Yorkie. That's usually a little bit better as well, right? It's, again, it's not a guarantee. They might take more after the golden retriever side and right. might be a little more shedding. You really can't guarantee it. So again, just visiting the kennel, playing with the puppies. If you're playing with the cute puppy and your eyes are watering and nose is running, it might not be the best, best suited pick for you. You can't guarantee any one dog to be hypoallergenic. What's the difference then, Stephanie, between hair and fur? So dogs with fur tend to shed, so they'll be your double-coated breeds. Uh, dogs with hair, more like your poodles, Yorkies, that need grooming. The hair isn't going to fall out, so they need regular grooming and trimming to keep control of that coat. Uh, with a golden doodle, you're going to have a mix of hair and fur. Oh. So it depends on which one they take after. And which actually has more dander? Is it the long-haired pets or the short-haired pets? Especially when it comes to cats, let's say. Yeah, it, you're going to have more volume of hair coming off of a long-haired animal, but the dander isn't necessarily determined by the length of the coat. Uh, shedding breeds are going to obviously have a bit more that stays around your house, but you can have just as much dander from a long-haired breed as a short-haired breed. How about parasites? How dangerous are they to our dogs and cats? So parasites can be quite troublesome to our dogs and cats. External parasites can cause hair loss, itching, uh, Tick-borne diseases can be a problem. Internal parasites, sometimes we don't notice that the dog has them or cat. The only way to know is to get a fecal sample, look under the microscope, see if you're seeing parasites in eggs. One of the most concerning things is actually human health concerns with parasites. So dog and cat roundworms can transfer to children, immunocompromised people. They're actually one of the leading causes of preventable blindness in the developing world. And there's a new parasite out, or I say out, it's emerging in Alberta um, called Echinococcus multilocularis. And it actually causes... Say that again? Echinococcus multilocularis. That's a mouthful, wow. It is, and it's emerging and actually quite frightening because it causes these cysts um, that can actually look like liver or brain tumors on oh CT goodness. scan. There was actually a woman diagnosed in Alberta a couple weeks ago. Uh, and that is very concerning because we won't know that our dog and cat has it until we get sick. Wow, that's incredible. So regular deworming is very important for both our pet and our health. What about when it comes to spay or neutering? What age should we bring our pets in to have that done? So I think it's a really good conversation to have with your vet because it's going to depend on the size of your dog as well as the lifestyle. You know, if we don't want the dog having puppies, we might want to get it spayed before that first heat. So in that six to eight, nine month range. There may be cases if you have a giant breed dog and the lifestyle warrants it that you might want to keep them intact a little bit longer just to get that bone and joint development. 
or some of these canine athletes, we might want to keep them intact a little bit longer just to let them develop a bit more. Your, most of your everyday pets generally find to spay before that first heat saves on the mess, saves the risk of an accidental pregnancy, which happens way more than people think it would. Let's talk about decline. It's now illegal here in Alberta it for is. our viewers it's in Alberta. Uh, I'm not sure about many of the other provinces around the country, but why is decline such a nasty thing to do to a pet? So people think that they're just taking the nail off the cat. It is essentially akin to taking your finger off at the last knuckle. So it does, it is quite a big surgery. It affects how that cat moves. It can affect its scratching behavior. Some cats, if they were scratching before, might switch to biting. And it just, I've seen pain and arthritis post declawing. So it's something that I'm, I'm not too upset is no longer allowed. As long as we do appropriate training and have- Trim those nails, right? Trim the nails, get them a good scratching post, a nice, tall, sturdy place to scratch uh, that they're comfortable scratching, maybe not get after your furniture. It's a much better alternative. Sydney Bodner Chuck, a veterinarian with the Coldale Pet Clinic. Thanks so much for coming in today. Not a problem at all, my pleasure.